today, whether you're at home today, uh, welcome. And together, let's be praying for Afghanistan. Let's be praying for Haiti uh, as we are, you know, prayer walking and, and, and engaging that, not only for our own city, but for the world. You could lift up Nigeria. Uh, you could lift up Iraq. You could lift up lots of different places all around the world that are experiencing not only COVID, but other tremendous storms are upon their shores. And so again, let me look at Haiti with the earthquake yesterday, and then Afghanistan with the Taliban uh, reclaiming or, or reasserting their power in these regions. Uh, together, we need to be a people of prayer for the world, because what COVID has shown us is that we are all essentially connected one to another, and one falls, we're all getting pulled. So together, let's pray for the world in which we live. Uh, we have spent a few weeks discussing authenticity, authority, and then accountability. Um, and we're going to make a shift today to talk about probably the critical issue in spiritual conflict. And in spiritual conflict or spiritual warfare, whatever term you choose to use, I recognize that for some of you, this language is really, really new and it's foreign to you. Um, but just because it's foreign to you doesn't mean it isn't actually impacting your day-to-day -day life. And so let me just say this right up front, a few statements as we dive in. I want you to know that on your own, you are absolutely no match for the enemy. He's good at what he does. He's better at what he does than you on your own. On your own, you are absolutely no match for the enemy. Yet in Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the enemy is no match for the church. And so it really does matter whose strength we are engaging this conflict in. And there are others of you who are pacifists and you're saying, I, I don't want to be in this conflict. I'm sorry. Whether you want to be or not, you're in it. The enemy never fights or plays fair. You're in it. Your marriage is in it. Your family is in it. Your singleness is in it. Your identity is in it. Our, your school is in it. Our government is in it. Our nation is in it, as every nation on the world is. We won't solve spiritual strongholds with human willpower. You won't do it. You won't do it. You will find yourself frustrated. You will not solve a spiritual problem with a natural, enga or natural engagement. So sometimes, sometimes, though, the solution is just doing what you know to do. So in saying all that, what am I saying? Spiritual conflict is like eating a bowl of spaghetti, not eating waffles. In waffles, everything can have its own little compartment. Eating a bowl of spaghetti, sometimes it's tough to figure out what end is connected to what end. Well, spiritual conflict is more like a bowl of spaghetti than it is conflict, so, or, than it is waffles. So we're doing our best to tease it out, but it is challenging. Let me give you an example. I mean, let's say, for example, you go to a marriage conference, and if, that's, if you're married and that's applicable to you, or if you're single, let's say you go to a leadership conference, or put whatever one you want in, but I'm just going to use marriage just for the sake of an argument. You go to a marriage conference, and it is fantastic. You learn tips, and you laugh, and you connect, and you communicate, and you learn all these tips and tools and wonderful thing. But at the marriage conference, there's never any mention of anything spiritual whatsoever. Um, here's the thing. The tools are great. The tips are great. The communication is great. All those things are great. If there's a stronghold, though, that is persistent in your marriage, that isn't going to go away just because you learned how to another tool for communication. That's not going to move aside if there's a spiritual issue that needs to be dealt with. And one of the challenges of the church is that oftentimes spiritual issues or, or spiritual warfare issues are pushed to the side and we only want to deal with the easy ones and not these ones. But that's not how Jesus lived, so it's not how we want to live. Okay? And so again, here's a good example for Lori and I. Uh, took us, you know, we're not the smart, smart Lori's brilliant, I'll, okay, I'll say it was me, but honestly, we're not the smartest, you know, we're not the sharpest tools in the shed or the, the brightest bulbs. I can't even say the expression, that's the struggle that I have in life, but we're not the brightest bulbs. But one of the things that we noticed in our marriage is that every single Saturday night, we got into a fight. Every single Saturday night in the first season, we got into a fight. And all of a sudden, we began to realize, oh, we, we, we kind of clued into it. Saturdays, we don't discuss really much in our marriage. We're not trying to fix anything. We're not, we don't do anything. I will pause everything, and we'll talk about it on Monday. And, oh, we're going to talk about it. But not Saturday, because the enemy just used that day. Because how many of you know that if you're going to get up to do something and you're distracted, you're diminished? 
And it was a spiritual issue. It had nothing to do with communication. It was just a spiritual issue. Here's another one that every single one of you will experience. And I guarantee you this happens in your life. And if you're not wise to it yet, the Holy Spirit's going to give you insight here. Here's what I promise you. Before any breakthrough, the enemy is not all-knowing, but he can read some signs because he's seen some lives and he's seen some stuff. Only God is all-knowing, but the enemy can read some signs. Right before you are about to break through, I promise you the enemy is going to revisit your life with a prior sin habit. I promise you. It will recycle back right before it is you're about to break through something. He can see it. And so again, it's not a natural thing. It's a spiritual thing that needs to be addressed. And so what is the main issue that we're going to talk about today in spiritual warfare? And it is this. The main issue is the demonic is nowhere or it's everywhere. All right? So we as the church or we as followers of Jesus, we can see the demonic nowhere. And that's some of us. And others of us see everything. There's a demon behind every chair, everything. That's a demon. That's demonic. That's demonic. No, the person's just being foolish. Ah, but the root of that is their idiocy. That's all it is. It's not more complicated than that. That's what they're doing. So it's, it's again, it's this all or nothing thinking. And what we need is wisdom and prophetic insight and discernment. In other words, the church is deficient because we actually don't need just the gift of teaching. We need the whole body of Christ using all the gifts of the spirit in order to be and to minister the way that Jesus did. And sometimes we as a church are trying to use some gifts of the Spirit and ignoring other ones, and we're wondering why there are some deficiencies. So we did spiritual gifts all last summer, and that's why we're doing spiritual conflict this summer. And so this all-or-nothing thinking, this the demonic is nowhere or it's everywhere, James Collis says, this is, this is, he explains it as people living either with a Godward view or a Satanward view. The Godward view is simply that, no, 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 no. In my life, oh, oh, I don't talk about anything negative. It's only love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness. In other words, I only want to see what God is doing. That's all I want to see. That's all I want to focus on. And for other people... You're the opposite, and you have this Satan word view. Everything is dark. If anything good happens, you're like, you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. You're like, yeah, it's coming. You know, congratulations, you got a promotion. <laughs> and I have to work beside Bill, don't I? Right? So you have this rob, kill, deception, devalue, destroy. You can only see what darkness is doing. And so the heart isn't which of these is correct. It is which is rooted in Christ is, is actually more helpful. Now, nowhere, nowhere, nowhere would I be advocating for you not to have a viewpoint of what God is doing is greater than what the enemy's doing. Nowhere would I ever do that. Jesus said this in John chapter 5, verse nothing. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. And so Jesus lived with his heart and his affections fully. God, what do you have for me today? What's the purpose? What do you want me to do? How do you want to use my life to make a difference in the world today? Jesus was constantly looking at life through the lens of what his father was doing. But equally true, though, Jesus knew that earth wasn't paradise. Earth wasn't heaven. We want to see heaven on earth, but earth isn't heaven, which means that there is sin and there's fallenness, there's the demonic activity, there's darkness, there's brokenness, and Jesus knew earth is not yet heaven. The kingdom of God is invading the earth, but it's clashing against the spirit of darkness. And so Jesus, here's what I want you to understand. He believed in a spirit world, which includes the demonic, which serve Satan. In other words, here's one of the questions that some of you ask all the time. In the planet, are we alone? Some of you ask a bigger question, like in the galaxy, are we alone? Well, that's way beyond my pay grade. I have no idea. But here's what I would say. Jesus would say to us, in the world, are we alone as humanity? Jesus would say, no, there's a spirit world. There's angels and there's demons. There's a spirit world that affects the world in which you and I live. Jesus knew on earth that kingdoms, these two kingdoms, are in conflict. As Gustav Wingren writes, when Jesus heals the sick or drives out an evil spirit, both of the stories we're going to look at today, Satan's dominion is departing and God's kingdom is advancing. 
All of, therefore, all of the activity of Jesus, all of the activity from his prayer to his choosing the disciples, all of the activity of Jesus, therefore, is in some form of conflict with the enemy's kingdom or the kingdom of darkness. Whether you can see it or not, you can see the effects of it. Everyone, if you're in the chat at home, you can type this. If you're here, you can say it very quietly under your mask. Everybody say, people are not the problem. People are not the problem. You're going to have to remind yourself of that about 500 times before now in time you get home. People are not the problem. And I know some of you right now are going, ooh, I know people are not the problem, but I know a person who's a problem. <laughs> Right? No, don't do that. People are not the problem. Though we create problems for one another, for sure, people are not the problem. Ephesians 6 says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Right? That doesn't mean we don't work things out between flesh and blood, but we don't wrestle it out there. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, in heavenly places. So there is this spiritual realm that affects the earthly realm. Here's a question that I want you to ask yourself today, and it's just a question for thought that some of you haven't engaged in that you need to engage in because it's important. Speaking of spiritual components, when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to politics, when it comes to race or ethnicity, when it comes to the pandemic and our various perspectives, here's a great question to ask. To what degree in these important conversations, to what degree in these important conversations is there a spiritual component? For some of you, you may be addressing all of these important issues with no awareness that anything about them can be spiritual whatsoever. But for others of you, though, you could be doing the exact opposite. And then you could be over-spiritualizing everything, and in doing so, we create a fence one against another. The scripture says this, though, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, that there is something spiritual in these last days that we find ourselves living in. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times or the last days, which happened at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, so 2,000 plus years ago, in the last days, it says some, everybody say some, not all, but in every generation, some will depart from the faith. They will depart from following Jesus. They will depart from the gospel. They will depart by, from anchoring their heart in Christ. They will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. Not teaching about the demonic, the demonic influences that we think, what we believe, and the world in which, or our worldview in which we see the world. And so when it comes to the spiritual realm, a question we have to ask ourselves in 2021 is how did we get to where we are today? Well, we've all come through, not all of us, but the 18th, 19th, 20th century, we came through something called the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was a reaction against both the Catholic and the Protestant church. But within the Enlightenment, it brought this thing called rationalism. Everyone say rationalism which regards reason as the ultimate source and test of knowledge. Reason, what I can think, what I can understand, what I can taste, what I can touch, what I can smell, what I can reason is real. If I can't reason it, if it's not rational, then it's therefore irrational, it's illogical, it's fantasy, it's nuance, it's just, it's, it's nothingness. And we, the Enlightenment threw out a lot of the things that we believed, that the church was taught, believed about the spiritual world. Those things got pushed to the side, which caused many then for to no longer believe in the demonic. And here's what I want you to know. That's perfect. That's exactly what the de demonic wants, is for us not to believe it exists. There's a line from a film that's a famous film called Usual Suspects, where one of the characters says, the greatest trick that the devil played is, uh, is, is convincing the world that he doesn't exist. The enemy does not want you to know what he's doing. He just wants you to feel its effects. And so rationalism played right into that. But rationalism was also a cultural response to something called reductionism that the church was doing, that we've talked about already, where we were too quick to reduce everything to a bottom line. So if someone did something we disapproved or disagreed with, that's a demon. If someone did something over here that we, this group doesn't see it the same way as we do, that's a demon. So everything just got reduced so quickly, so the culture pushed back against that. Now, interestingly enough, in 2021, the script has been flipped. 
It's been absolutely flipped. Haven't you noticed that one of the things that we are living in the climate of our culture is it's very polarized? It's very reductionist based. You hear it all the time in people's language. In fact, you can agree that something is a problem. You can have a different perspective on how to solve the problem. But if you don't say it the right way and see it the way that they see it, you'll quickly see how powerful reductionism is. Just say the wrong thing online. You just say it the wrong thing. Or this, just right now, just try to make a joke. No one wants any humor at all right now. <laughs> Nothing's funny. Everything's serious. It's just the time that we find ourselves in. And we're living in a zero-sum time, and we're destroying one another. Unless you affirm everything about me, you don't love me. I don't even affirm everything about myself. I got to still live with myself every day. Do you, do you agree with everything that so-and-so preached? I don't agree with everything I said already to this message. What part do you disagree with? I don't know. I'll watch it back and go, oh, ooh, ooh really? It's powerful, the dogma of the world that we find ourselves. So we have to ask ourselves a question, though. What's the source of that? If it only leads to polarization and division and ultimately not just disagreement but destruction, what is the source of that? Not what is every element in that, but what's the source of that? That's not the heart of God. So again, when we have reductionism, it always leads to divisive or unnecessary pain and hardship experienced then and today. A couple of examples as we keep going. How many have ever heard in church the word holiness? Can I see your hands, please? Holiness. Without holiness, no one, you know, sees the Lord. Or without holiness, it's vital. Well, if you define holiness by only what you're against and not who we're for, this is a problem. If we define holiness only as, remove, as the Holy Spirit removing sin from our lives, but not that we're being conformed to the image of Jesus, that we have more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control being evident in our lives, I celebrate the removal and the conviction of whatever sin, because no sin breeds anything but death. So I celebrate that part of the holiness process. But I'm here to tell you, you can absolutely, Jesus taught, you can absolutely have something removed. But if that is not now occupied by the Spirit, you got a problem because there's the Spirit world's going to circle back to find home here. This is what Jesus taught. It's not just the emptying of ourselves. Christians are not called merely to die to ourselves. We're called to die to ourselves so that we can live to Christ. We're called to be set free by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be filled more with the power of the Holy Spirit. We are, we are called to be generous or to have generosity in our lives so that we can open up more room for God to bless us with different things so that we can increase in generosity. And that's not just money, that's time, talent, treasure, and all these things within our hearts and lives. This is the way in which the kingdom lives. But again, if we only define holiness by what we don't do, but rather than who we are becoming, then we've reduced it down to something that Jesus never lived, taught, or engaged the world in which we live. And here's one of the side effects when we as a church reduce everything down, where every problem is demonic, every problem in the world is demonic. Here's what we do when we do that. When we reduce everything down to a demonic root, we deeply wound people. We deeply wound people. And where have we historically done a really poor job as the Church of Jesus Christ here, is we have done a historically poor job to people who struggle with mental health and mental health issues and mental illness. We've done a, we've done a, a deep, deep damaging work here. Now, can there be a spiritual component in somebody's life? Sure there can. But how many of you know that we are body, soul, and spirit? That sometimes it can also just be chemistry. And God is going to give wisdom to someone else to come alongside to engage that and help somebody. I know now, because I'm 48 years old and I'm not 27 anymore. I'm not a young kid. I'm a middle-aged man. 
and I've been in ministry and I've seen a thing or two and here's what I know. I know a lot of pastors are scared to death to ever say that they are struggling with anxiety or depression out of fear from their church seeing them as spiritually weak. Church, we have a problem with not only pastors but with followers of Jesus because the Bible that I read, Paul said, oh, when I'm weak, then I am strong in Christ because I am dependent. But we've become addicted to people who look like experts who have no problems whatsoever and are afraid to confess their weakness so that at least they are seeing anyone, you know, like for this appearance. How many of you know that we all got to stop acting and we got to be honest so the Lord can bring healing and health to our hearts and lives. We as the church can't be addicted to people playing a part. I'll be the first one to tell you that I, I, I man, I've been, I've been in counseling. I've seen a therapist. I saw one for an entire year, went through something very difficult. Uh, I saw a therapist for a year. I saw another therapist for two weekends. We didn't get along well. That's a different story. That's, I'll put it all. I would go in, and there was a couple sessions, and I, their office, it was pre COVID, their office was quite small. And so I'd go in, and I don't like physical proximity. If you don't know that about me, I don't like physical. I don't like, hey, can you give me a hug? Well, if, it, if you does it feel good for you, do you like it? Not really, but I'll stand there and, like, <laughs> oh, okay. Right? But her office, I don't mean it was like tiny, it was. Her knees were touching my knees. <laughs> and so the first session, I walked in, I said, my gosh, this is a small space. I didn't say anything. And I walked in again, I sat down, and when her knees rubbed mine, I was like, this is really tight, really close. And she stopped and said, what, why do you feel the need to insult my space? And I went, I'll see you later. How much do I owe you? <laughs> I owe you how much for what? Mm-hmm just didn't work. But I have amazing, amazing thing. But here's what I know. I'm not anti... Oh, that story was irrelevant. It was just, I thought it was, it was funnier in my head than when it was coming out, but I was, already commi- I was already committed to it, and I just had to see it through. Okay. Remember a few minutes ago, I said, I don't even agree with everything I just said. Maybe there. Okay. So, here's what I'm saying in this moment. I am, I, I am pro-psychologists, but here's what psychologists are not. They're not gods. Well, I'm not anti in any way. I, I've gone. But here's what I know. The psychologist that I saw was wonderful. Helped me with my emotions and all of those things. But they didn't help me at all with the spiritual components of the battle that I was going through. That's a different conversation. Just like my medical doctor. Well, my medical doctor is also a follower of Jesus, which is wonderful. <laughs> Closes the door. Here's what we're going to figure out medically. Now, no, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we look for wisdom. Yeah! Love it. I love that part of the physical. I don't like the rest part of the physical. That's not nice at all. (laughs) But I want you... Oh, that took a lot of time, all that stuff. Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 33. I want you to notice something here really, really important. Every single one of us have imperfect families, which means it creates various issues in our lives in need of healing. Uh, We're fearfully and wonderfully wonderfully made with complex chemistry and systems and biology. And due to trauma or circumstances, each one of us can become ill. And that illness can manifest physically, it can manifest mentally, uh, and there can be some spiritual roots to what we're getting at. And so we need, we need both a Godward view and also an enemy. What, what's he doing? And a Satanward view. Not an obsession with the enemy, but to know. We're not unaware of his schemes. But we need to redi- re- uh, resist reductionism and embrace the full ministry of Jesus, how he uses the whole body of Christ. Here's a good example. I'm going to read it. It's not going to come on the screen, but I'm going to read Luke 8. It says, They sailed to the country of the Gezerians. Luke 8, chapter 26. I'm going to read a little passage of scripture here. It's not going to come on the screen because I'm just doing this now. Which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on the land, there was a man, I'm sorry, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he wore no clothes, and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said with a loud voice, I want you to notice here. Uh, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded, Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. 
For many a time it had seized him, and he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus asked him, not the man. Jesus is speaking to the demonized or the demonic in this man. Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion, for many demons had entered him. Ooh, ooh, that's a moment. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside, and they begged Jesus to let them enter these. Hold that thought for a second. Uh, so he gave them permission. This is the language, by the way, of authority. Jesus gives them permission. Remember I said a few moments ago, we're no match for the enemy, but in Christ, the enemy's no match for the church. This is the language of authority. Jesus gives them permission. It says, the demons came out of the man and they entered the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bay into the lake, into the lake and drowned. If you're a lover of pigs, this is a tough story for you. Uh, Luke 8, verses 38 to 39. It says, the man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away. Now Jesus is speaking to the man. Jesus knew when to speak to spiritual issues and when to speak just to the man. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. In other words, no, don't come follow me. Don't be a part of my inner core of 12. That's not your assignment. Your assignment is to go home and to testify all that Jesus had done with, for you. Because everybody in your town knows you one way. And now you've had an encounter. And now you've had an encounter with Jesus. And so now everybody in your town is going to know you differently because of the engagement that you've had with me. It's this beautiful, beautiful moment, a paused moment. Most theologians note the authority in the scripture that we just read, that even when the demonic said, could you cast us into the pigs? People think that's a really, really weird part of the story. One theologian that I was reading hypothesized that the demonic were not even allowed to leave the region because they had a localized assignment and they are under authority. And so that's why Jesus sent them into the pigs. They couldn't just go wherever it is that they wanted to go. They had, they had to stay where their assignment was. Because how many of you know that there are demonic assignments over nations? Okay, they can't just go where they want. They are under authority. When you look at what Jesus talks about, whether it was Jairus' daughter, you know, when people speak with faith, they always understood authority. And that's what Jesus marveled at. Next story, though, it's a different story. So here in the story we see the spiritual problem in this man is demonization. It is demonic possession. Oppression doesn't matter. It's demonization. This is the problem in this man's life. Jesus deals with the demonic the man is absolutely miraculously set free, incredibly set free, goes back, now tells a different story of what Jesus had done for him because Jesus does for him what nobody else could do for him, okay? It's an amazing story of healing and wholeness, and Jesus not only heals this man physically, but then he begins to re-engage him back in community and begins to restore him here. It's an incredible, incredible thing that God does. God does not just care about one part of your life. He cares about the whole of your life. And that's evident in this story. It's the same chapter, Luke chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, Luke 8, verses 42 to 48. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and she had spent all her living on physicians, and she could not be healed by anyone. So she wants to get better. The part isn't, the heart isn't that she doesn't want to. She wants to. It's just nobody can figure out what is occurring within her medically. He says, she came up behind him, behind Jesus, and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, master, the crowds surround you are pressing in on you. Uh, contra I just paraphrased Peter there. The question isn't who touched you. The question is who didn't touch you? Everybody is pushing in around you. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. Someone touched me. For I perceive that dunamis, or power, has gone out from me. Something has happened here in this moment that's beyond just a touch. It's a supernatural moment. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him. And then she said how she had been immediately healed. And Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in the shalom of God. Go in the peace of God. Live now, not with fear and trembling. Live with a peace that passes all understanding. This woman had an encounter with the Prince of Peace, and she left with then with the peace of God. Now, due to her bleeding, this woman was ceremonially unclean. 
Whoever she touched would also make them unclean. She's been living alone like this for 12 years. She's done all she could with physicians. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Number one, is there anywhere in this story that she is chastised by Jesus at all by seeking help from a physician? The answer is no. By the way, the story that I'm telling you right now was written by a physician. His name's Luke. He wrote the book. Luke chapter 8. Luke, he's a physician. She is healed physically by Jesus, but she is also restored socially by Jesus because she's no longer unclean, but she's clean. And the life that she couldn't engage for the previous 12 years, now she can fully engage. And she's also restored relationally by Jesus. Jesus calls her daughter. Notice in both of these stories, Jesus cares about the whole of a person's life, their physical, relational, and social parts of their lives. In both these stories, though dramatically different, there is no in looking at the woman's story where Jesus is talking to anything de demonic. She simply has a physical condition that there's no wisdom on earth that could heal or fix. And so she is supernaturally and miraculously healed, but no inference about demonic whatsoever. Jesus knew how to minister differently to the different needs that people presented or came to him. In both stories, we get a glimpse of what King Jesus' kingdom looks like. It looks like heaven on earth. It looks like kingdom here, but not yet fully due to the presence of sin and thus the continued work of darkness. Now as I close, I just want to do the opposite here. I want, you just, I want to just say that the enemy always does the opposite. The enemy, every time he speaks, he speaks with lies, but oftentimes they are not outright lies. They are half-truths that actually then make whole lies. He is a master at reminding you of what you've done albeit forgetting to remind you who you are as a result of what Christ has done. Because he wants our identity to be in our brokenness and not in the wholeness that Jesus provides. And so what that can look like is this. Every single one of us here have one thing. We all have relational wounds, every one of us. And when you are relationally wounded, here's what I want you to know. The enemy will always tempt you with rela relational iniquity because it creates further brokenness. So wherever there's relational woundedness, the next thing you'll be tempted to do is to gossip about so-and-so, because that creates further brokenness in relationships, in our hearts, in our lives. When we engage gossip as an example, it may feel in an instant like a balm, but it isn't. It's a bondage. The same thing as if there's a sexual wound. He'll tempt you always with sexual immorality or iniquity because he knows that will just create further brokenness and further bondage. None of us grew up in perfect families, although mine was pretty close. None of us grew up in perfect families. And so we all have a wound from that. The enemy will tempt you to live into false identities. Some of the greatest leaders that we admire are actually not living true selves, but false selves. They're living out identities because they don't believe in the core of their being that they're enough, and so they're going to prove it through success, or they're going to prove it through their. Nothing wrong with success. But if the heart isn't healed, then this just creates further brokenness down the road. And the enemy will let you build something great if it will create more brokenness in others. Our call as Christians is to resist rationalism, <laughs> not that we become irrational. But we have to embrace that some issues are spiritual in nature. You may not be able to figure it out or rationalize it, but it's a spiritual issue. Just like you can't complete a 300-piece puzzle if 50 of the pieces are missing, all I'm saying is there are some pieces that are spiritual. And you're not going to complete it without them. But our call as Christians is also to resist reductionism. Sometimes the issues aren't more complicated. All right? Some, sometimes we just have to stop being foolish. Weekly can't complete a 300-piece puzzle using the same 50 pieces over and over again. Jesus knew when to speak to the demonic. And he knew when to honor a woman 
whose faith had just made them well. May we have the same wisdom. Every problem has the identical solution, which is Jesus, but we have the wisdom to know what part of the body of Christ or what part of the gospel does somebody need for such a time as this. This is what we need in the church to grow up and to restore our Christian witness in the world in which we live. Because here's what's true of us, and here's what's true of Life Center in this moment. There are some people in your life God will bring into your life for a reason. There are some people that you'll be in each other's lives beautifully, but it'll only be for a season. And then there's precious few people that will be in your life for a lifetime. And so Pastor Rhonda, I'm going to invite her up because she's going to share about the gift of God that someone brought to Life Center for a season. We didn't know, but it's for a season. And God's done something in their life, and now their season of transition is upon them. So I'm going to invite Pastor Rhonda as the campus pastor of Orleans to share, and then together we're going to pray.